Greetings and welcome to the first webinar in Real Mushrooms educational series, Mushrooms for Pet Health. I'm Doc Rob Silver, your host and your tour guide today. I'm going to help you navigate a pathway into this topic of medicinal mushrooms so you can learn how to help your pets feel better and live longer. Okay, I've got to navigate the technology too. There we go. I'm Chief Veterinary Officer for Real Mushrooms, and I'm responsible for creating this line of pet-specific products that are labeled and adapted to the special needs of dogs and cats. I'm an integrative, holistic veterinarian of over 40 years of practice experience. And for the past 25 years, I've been formulating supplements for veterinary use that are still used daily by thousands of veterinarians around the world. I'm excited about the opportunity to provide the amazing health benefits that mushrooms can give to our beloved four-legged companions. Well, okay, let's get started. Well, what are mushrooms? Well, they are members of the fungi kingdom. We have an animal kingdom, plant kingdom, and the fungi kingdom. What's interesting, and maybe one reason why mushrooms seem to really have such a strong effect on animals, is that there's a lot of similar DNA between animals and fungi. There's over a hundred and a half, uh, I'm sorry, over 1.5 million species in the fungi kingdom, 10% of which are mushrooms. Fungi are really important for the health of our planet and as well as for our pets and ourselves. They're the recyclers of our planet. They break down plant and animal matter into reusable nutrients. They recycle it all. Mushrooms are considered macro fungi. They have a complicated life cycle as compared to more simple molds and yeasts and mildews. And mushrooms can be edible, very tasty in fact, can be toxic, watch out, psychotropic, ugh, or medicinal in nature. And um, many edible mushrooms also have copious medicinal properties. Some medicinal mushrooms are not that edible, but with appropriate processing and boiling in hot water, we could make their goodies available for our health purposes. Okay. Mushrooms, they've got a really long history of use by humans. Probably, you know, the first early humans um, gathered mushrooms, looked at mushrooms, tried mushrooms, probably learned the hard way which ones were toxic and which ones were beneficial. Um, Oxy, the ice man, you know, the, this, this, cave, this ice man or caveman that was found that fell into a glacier, froze to death, very well preserved in his little pouch on his side over over there they had um they were able to find two different species of um of medicinal mushrooms polypores we'll tell you what that means in just a little bit and on this these pottery and these pottery from um ancient um chile and peruvian artifacts you can see mushrooms were part of their culture and they were used extensively for medicine but also for spiritual purposes um but, you know, different cultures have different attitudes about mushrooms. The Asian, Eastern European cultures, very pro-mushroom. British, Europeans, they stigmatize mushrooms, probably based on their toxicity. The cultures in Europe, Eastern Europe and Asia, do a lot of mushroom foraging. And unless you know very exactly how to identify a mushroom, there are some very toxic ones that look very similar to some very tasty ones. So it's something that you need to really be good at before you start doing it, because it could be hazardous to your health. Um, let's see, sorry, I'm losing track here with all these things. Um, okay, let's start with the uh, mushroom anatomy. And we have down at the bottom of the mushroom, we see the mycelial threads, and that's what the mushroom arises from. And we'll talk about the relationship between the mushroom and the mycelium in just a bit, because it's a really important piece of information. And you can see that it comes on a stalk and then has that cap. The caps can take various different forms. We'll show you some photographs and explain to you the differences between those different types of mushrooms. But probably the most important determinant of the type of mushroom it is, is how the spore bearing um, structures are in that mushroom. And we can have 
um, gills, and you might be familiar seeing some shiitake mushrooms with the gills underneath them and the spores come out of those gills. There's other mushrooms that have pores like rishi, and the spores come down through those tubes of those pores. And then there's a uh, one mushroom species called lion's mane that has these teeth toothed <laughs> um, spore bearing structures. We'll look at all of these, discuss them, um, discuss them some more. And, you know, so getting a little more into detail on these spore bearing structures, because I think it's important to understand how we classify mushrooms, and that can help you with your choice of mushrooms as well. The gills will have we'll see in mushrooms like shiitake, maitake, oyster mushroom, the portobello mushroom, you know, those are gills, those are gilled mushrooms, and the gills are their spore bearing structures. But we also can have pores, as you can see in this large brown structure in the middle of the slide. Um, this is a, a, a reishi, and the pores, and turkey tail is also a, a pore, um, a, a spore bearing, a Spore bearing spore structure, okay? And then we have the teeth, the teeth spore bearing structures, it's a mouthful, as we see in lion's mane over on the left hand side of the slide. We also have spores that don't come out of these pores, gills, or teeth, but are actually created in sacs. The sacs can then rupture and have the spores that get spread. And these spores, once they spread, they get spread by the wind and they can go great distances, or they can just fall right below where the mushroom is. But some very tasty edible mushrooms like truffles and morels have the sacs. And then the caterpillar mushroom, a very unique type of mushroom called cordyceps. It has a lot of very interesting properties. We won't go into great detail with cordyceps today, but at the end, I'm going to give you a summary slide that has, uh, that kind of summarizes what the best uses are of these six mushrooms, although we're only talking specifically about five due to, you know, time constraints. The shelf or the bracket fungi generally don't have stalks, but they can have a little bit of a stalk, but generally they grow on the tree. They grow on that dead wood and they just kind of create like a shelf. Um, so, yes, they, they grow on wood, they grow on compost and manure, or they can grow on caterpillars. And each species of mushroom has its own preferred substrate that it grows on. And in order to get the most potency out of a mushroom, you want it to grow on the substrate that it naturally has adapted to grow on. So um, that brings us to the mushroom um, life cycle. And um, let's start with the spores at the very top. And there's two polarities of spores. We've got negative spores and positive spores, male or female spores. And when the spores start to germinate, they create a little very thin walled tube called um, hyph the hypha or hyphae tubes. And there's, there's the positive and the negatives, the male and the female hyphae tubes, they'll join and they form a mycelium because when they join, they are a complete um, organism. They've got you know, both all the genetic code from both sides of the of the aisle, so to speak. Um, these hyphal tubes join to form mycelium, and the mycelium is what we call the vegetative stage of the fungus. And vegetative means that it basically um, di it basically um, grows and proliferates and gets larger um, by digesting the um, the substrate that it's growing in, and then from digesting it, it, it absorbs the nutrients and then that promotes its growth. At some point in time, the when conditions are right, the mycelium organizes into what we call a hyphal knot and a primordium, and it begins the process of developing into the mushroom. The mushroom is the reproductive stage. It has the spores in it. So when the conditions are right and the mycelium for however they figure this out, decide it's time they need to expand and propagate and reproduce and spread, that's when the mushroom gets formed. And then, you know, the cycle repeats itself. The spores, germ the sp the spores are released, they germinate, they form hyphal tubes that, that, that fuse into mycelium. And then when conditions are right, we have our fruiting body. So it's, um, it's an interesting life cycle. So when we talk about cultivating mushrooms and the importance of this has to do with sourcing a product that has potency that's going to help your pet, you know? And um, so what historically for thousands of years, mushrooms have been used medicinally, but it's the mushroom part 
of the life cycle that has been used. The mycelium is just used to propagate the mushroom, which is then eaten or used medicinally. Um, so the, my, the mycelial mouse is vegetative, and in the cultivation of mushrooms, they will grow the mycelium on grain. They call that spawning of the mycelium. And once the grain has been completely um, covered with mycelium, it doesn't completely remove the grain, but it does digest some of it to promote its own growth. A lot like tempeh. If you've seen tempeh, that's actually um, mycelium growing on, on soybeans. And um, so they then take that mushroom, uh, that sorry, that mycelium and grain, and then they put that on the appropriate substrate of the mushroom, which it then grows and creates more mycelium, and then ultimately converts and 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 transforms into the reproductive stage into the fruiting body, which is what the mushroom is. The fruiting body is the reproductive stage. So, and there was a study that was published in 2016 that measured the active ingredients that were found in mushrooms um, versus in mycelium, and they found substantially higher levels of the important active um, compounds in mushrooms. And I'll go into that here in just a little bit as I start describing to you what these active compounds are. <clears throat> okay, let's move on. There we go. This is an example of um, outdoor mushroom cultivation um, being done. You can see this greenhouse or shade house that's temperature and humidity controlled. It's, it's um, shaded from direct sunlight. It takes a long time for mushrooms to grow like this almost half a year. So it can be a very costly process um, to, to do this. And this is one reason why it takes so long for us to get these mushrooms to have the highest potency because we have to allow them to grow to maturity. In the case of this slide, we're seeing reishi mushrooms growing on wooden, dead wood logs that have been submerged under compost. It's really quite pretty. In fact, I am, um, okay. Excuse me for a second, but here I actually have one of those uh, examples of these of the reishi mushroom with the camera right here. Uh, you can see, maybe you can't see, but it's got the pores on the underside. And in this case, it has a stalk because it's growing up from that stump. But in the wild, you might just find them looking like shelves on a tree. I've seen some cool photographs of pets sitting on these shelf brackets on these on these trees. It's very pretty cool. Um, I think if you search for pets on mushrooms, you'll find those photographs. Um, but part, so part of the cultivation process is growing the mycelium on grain. Here's a photograph of a jar with grain and mycelium in it. And this will be taken and then used to seed substrate. They might put the mycelium and into a, 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 a hole in the log and put the mycelium in that, or they may put it on some compost. Um, and this is how they do it. The biggest that, what's interesting, though, is there are a number of mushroom companies or companies, I wouldn't know if I call them mushroom companies, that instead of allowing the spawn to propagate um, on its natural substrate and then grow into the mushrooms, um, they just take the mycelium in the grain and they dry it. And so you get about 50 percent grain and about 50 percent mycelium, which is way less potent than the mushrooms themselves. And, you know, that's okay. And there is, uh, there is, uh, there obviously are some health benefits to that, but not nearly as potent as the mushrooms themselves. What bugs me is that many of these companies don't reveal the fact that these are mostly grain. And if you're, if you, if you have an animal with cancer, we try to downsize the amount of carbohydrates that, that are being given because carbohydrates feed cancer. Um, if you have an animal has allergies to grains, I mean, so many animals are on grain-free diets now because of these allergies, that could be a problem as well. So just, I want you to be aware of that, okay? Let's talk about now, what are the bioactive fungal constituents? Well, probably the most well-researched and most well-known, and probably the first one that was determined, are the beta-glucans. And we'll describe those in greater depth in the next few slides. Triterpenes are plant molecules. They've got um, their, their um, 
fat soluble lip they're lipid molecules and they have very potent properties they cross the blood brain barrier we find triterpenes and terpenes in cannabis as well and they also aid cannabis in having its medical potency as well we've got glycoproteins and manins we've got ergosterol ergosterol is a pre vitamin d2 if you put mushrooms out in sunlight you'll convert it into vitamin d2 and you can get your vitamin d that way through your mushrooms. In fact, now there are shiitake mushroom extracts that are very rich sources of vitamin D. Stay tuned. We've got some interesting information about that coming up in a future webinar. Ergothionine is a very potent antioxidant that is, that is found in mushrooms and for which animals and people have receptors. It works very well in mammalian bodies. PSP and PSK, these are extracts of the mycelium, specially grown mycelium in a special culture. We'll talk about this in greater extent in just a slide or two. Um, eratinine, lentinin, LEM, these are all types of biofungal constituents found in the shiitake mushroom. Each of them are, some of them are protein bound um, beta glucans, some of them are uh, terpene related, triterpene related. Um, shiitake mushroom, as tasty as it is, also has huge medicinal properties. So speaking of beta-glucans, if you look at this diagram, those red lines in the diagram, this is the, a cross-section, a diagrammatic cross-section, the cell wall of a fungus, and um, the beta-glucans serve as structural components for the fungus. They don't have any immune-enhancing properties for themselves. They're much like the rebar that you might find um, reinforcing concrete to increase its strength. So for the mushroom, the beta-glucans are strictly structural in nature. Um, and here's another uh, another view. You can see, I, I wish I had a pointer with me, but I, we couldn't figure out how to configure that. Um, but you can see these are two glucose molecules that are joined through different bonding um, mechanisms, uh, beta, the beta-1-3 um, linkage and the beta-1-6 linkage, and you could have cross branches as well. And the potency of the beta-glucan molecule is measured by the number of cross branches and the type of cross branches they have. And some mushroom species are known to have very elaborate cross branchings. Others are more simple, but beta-glucans have many, many properties, probably best known as potent immune modulators, but we also know they can help to lower cholesterol along with other molecules that are found in the mushroom um, plant. In the mushroom, not, not a plant, I'm sorry. So um, here are some uh, research, um, some clinical applications for beta-glucans that have been derived from, public, from published research. Certainly for the immune system, we've seen beta-glucans effective for infections. We have one study in, uh, in shelter puppies showing that beta-glucans actually improve their response to rabies vaccinations because oftentimes they're so immune compromised coming from their rescue situations that they don't even take the vaccination and process it to provide protection. You know, so this could help a lot with those puppies that don't, that especially if you're doing vaccine titers and they come up insufficient, preconditioning with beta-glucans can really help. Um, certainly any immune mediated disease and any kind of immunosuppression, beta-glucans are good for all of those immune system problems. We think of it commonly for cancer, either uh, being used as a, as a way of improving immune system function at the same time as we're using chemotherapy and radiation, but it also can help with chemotherapy side effects like the anemia that you can get, um, and it can help to stimulate the bone marrow, as you can see in the right-hand column. It also can have some directly anti-neoplastic properties, although those are more likely due to the triterpenes. In general, we think of the beta-glucans as activating the immune system of the animal or the human, so its immune system itself can deal with the cancer. But there's other, other um, applications that have been determined for beta-glucans, that it can help with um, resolving trauma, it can help with wound healing. Um, it even ha can have a benefit for allergies or stress. Um, as I mentioned, cholesterol level, cardiac function, and the fiber, and, and the beta-glucan is a form of insoluble fiber, that fiber also helps to promote healthy bacterial growth in your microbiome, in your bowel. 
and we've also seen it help to regulate blood glucose levels. So as you can see, beta-glucans have many properties, and because beta-glucans are common to all mushrooms, that's why you may have wondered, why does it seem like all mushrooms have so many similar properties? It's There's a reason for that. It's because of the beta-glucans that they contain. So um, here's an interesting study where they experimentally induced cancer in mice. They injected cancer cells under their skin, and then they fed them different types of glucans, glucans from yeast, glucans from seaweed, glucans from mushroom, and no glucans at all. And then they weighed the, the, the um, tumors after a certain period of time, two weeks, um, and they were tumors for both breast cancer and lung cancer. And you can see from the height of the purple bar that, the, that the, these tumors grew to be quite large, but in, under the influence of yeast, seaweed, seaweed, and mushroom glucans, in each case, the weight of the mushrooms, uh, the weight of the tumors, rather, was significantly less be, as a result of their immune modulation of the mice. Um, now, PSP, PSK, and many, many pet owners who have cancer have been learning about PSP based on a study that was done in dogs at the University of Pennsylvania, dogs that had hemangiosarcoma. And the study was surprisingly successful in helping the dogs in this study. Now, PSP is, and PSK is the, is the Japanese version of PSP. They're both derived from the mycelium of the turkey tail mushroom. And the mycelium is grown in a special super nutrient broth, not on grain. After growing it in the super nutrient broth, they then use a pharmaceutical technology to extract these individual molecules and concentrate them and then provide them in a capsule form for people and now for pets. The product is called Immunity. It's very expensive, but then again, so is chemotherapy. It's only available from the one Chinese company that has this process patented. And many pet owners not understanding that not all things from that PSP, even though it's from the turkey tail mushroom, is not the same, or turkey tail mycelium, is not really the same as a turkey tail mushroom. But prior to the pharmaceutical development of PSP and PSK, turkey tail mushroom has been used for hundreds, if not thousands of years in humans, mainly in Asia, but in other um, indigenous cultures to treat cancer. Um, Tramides versicolor is one name for the turkey tail mushroom. Another name for the turkey tail mushroom, an older name that we don't use so much anymore, is Coriolis versicolor. Now, let me talk a little bit more um, about that study. I've got it on this next slide here. Um, here's, the, here's a kind of a picture of the front page of that study. And, and what they found was at the highest dosing. OK, so what they did was they took dogs that had hemangiosarcoma, which is a very, very aggressive cancer of the spleen. And they and typically the first thing we do when we diagnose this in a dog is we go in and we remove that spleen because the spleen is like a time bomb. It's going to keep rupturing and, and, and dumping blood into the abdomen and the dog becomes more anemic and weaker and then ultimately you know, passes away. So the first thing we do is we remove that spleen and then um, we offer chemotherapy, which is not super effective. What they found was that the highest dosing tier for PSP, 100 megs per kg per day of the PSP, extended the life of these dogs twice as long, pretty much, as the historical controls for dogs that were splenectomized and had chemotherapy. Well, the results really were quite amazing and got everybody's attention. And as a result, turkey tail and PSP are extremely popular amongst pet owning uh, the, the pet parents with pets who have been diagnosed with cancer. All right, well, let's, now you've kind of got a little bit of a background on mushrooms, on their, the different types of mushrooms we have, the things that are in mushrooms. Let's talk about a few of the individual mushrooms. There are so many mushrooms out there. There's just, you know, so many mushrooms, so little time, you know, as they say. But let's start with a few, and that's a good place to start because we'll follow up in future webinars with more information, more detailed information. We're going to dig down on the details with each mushroom and with vitamin D and a number of different topics that I know would be of great interest to pet parents. 
Reishi, or Ganoderm, is probably the most well-known of all the mushrooms. It's considered to be the mushroom of immortality, and it was the mushroom of the emperors. The, the emperors of China would have, uh, people would bring as tributes to the emperors of China the largest Ganoderma mushrooms they could find. Um, as a as a tribute, as an honor. Ganoderma grows wild throughout the world. It grows in the United States in a lot of different places, on, on dead woods and forests in the Northwest and the Northeast, all over the place. Not always the Ganoderma lucidum, it's different species, but they all have similar but different um, um, effects. Um, we call it a polypore because it has those tubes, those pores, and many, many of them. So it's a polypore. Um, usually we see them as brackets on brand, on trees, on dead wood, that sort of a thing. In, in Asia, it's been used for over 4,000 years for a variety of, of, of human complaints, as you can see over here, from hepatitis to, to neurasthenias, but also for longevity. You know, so it's, if I were, if I were, I always say this, if I was stranded on a desert island, and had only one mushroom to choose and didn't want to choose an edible mushroom because that might make more sense, choose an edible one. But um, I would choose the reishi mushroom because it just has so many beneficial properties, even though it's not edible. In fact, it's incredibly bitter. Um, I take it in my espresso um, because it, ma you know, where's the camera? it matches the bitterness of that espresso. Let me take a seat. So, um, it's an amazing mushroom. Um, and from published research, we've determined it has a wide variety of properties, all the way from having some pain relieving properties. Um, it inhibits histamine release, just like an antihistamine. Um, so it could be, and it, and it improves immune system function. So, you know, think of it for allergies. Um, it has anti-inflammatory activity, antibacterial, antioxidant. It's good for cancer, antiviral for HIV, normalizes blood pressure, and even can have a benefit for um, preventing Alzheimer's. Um, good for the lungs in terms of bronchitis and, and coughing. It helps to protect the liver. It has so many uses. It's an adaptogen. It helps the body um, respond to stress. And amazingly, it also has calming properties. In fact, I've put reishi in one of the two new soft chews that we've developed. This one is called, well, actually it's in both of the new soft chews because it's such an amazing mushroom. But uh, specifically, I've put it into our Relax soft chews. And we'll talk about that a little more when I get to lion's mane, which is coming up here right next. But it also enhances bone marrow activity and lowers cholesterol, as we've learned all beta-glucans can do. Lion's mane. Isn't that a, that's not what I would think of as a mushroom. Really weird looking. Looks like a bunch of icicles. They call it the, the, the hedgehog mushroom, the coral hedgehog. Hericium arenaceus is its name, and hericium means um, hedgehog. And those are the teeth that are the spore-bearing structures in the lion's mane. And I will tell you, this is one of the tastiest mushrooms I've ever had. I try to have some of it every week, and it's got such a solid mass. You can actually slice it into uh, steaks, and you can fry them or, or grill them and put them on a sandwich. It's very tasty. I highly recommend you check it out if you have not already. Um, it's found everywhere, um, all over the world. And as most mushrooms, it will, you know, it grows on dead or dying um trees and in that's the process that it is recycling those dead or dying trees. Um, but when you look at this um, mushroom and you can't see it because of my little video thing here, but we think of it, it almost looks like a brain and there's some other photos of the mushroom that do look like a brain. And the, the ancient peoples, when they were trying to figure out what things were good for, they developed something called the doctrine of signatures. That's part of folklore, but amazingly enough, it actually works for some reason, like cures like. And so because this looks like a brain, the properties that it has benefits the brain, mentation, cognition, thinking, um, anxiety, all of those types of properties. And in this era of stress, um, lion's mane is probably the single most popular mushroom being purchased by the consumer. We can think of its use for healthy digestion, um, for soothing a nervous system and stress, um, also for general debility and weakness. Many mushrooms are considered to be very restorative and very good for debility and weakness. And many mushrooms, when they're powdered, if you 
put them into a bleeding wound will stop the bleeding. That's what a hemostatic is. From published research, and again, over here, you can see, um, is it just coincidence or is it nature's intent that lion's mane mushrooms look like a brain? I don't know if it's nature's intent, but it certainly helps guide us as far as understanding what to use these things for. There are terpenes, in addition to the beta-glucans in lion's mane, called hericinones in the mushroom. Ericinines are found in the mycelial um, nutrient broth cultures, not in the mycelium grown on grain cultures. And they have been found, they stimulate the production of nerve growth factor. They're good for head trauma. They help they help the brain to repair itself. It can also, like so many other mushrooms, regulate blood sugar, can support cardiovascular health, um, improves blood flow to the brain. And just like an herb that I've used quite a bit, ginkgo, ginkgo also improves blood flow to the brain. And as a result, it actually improves memory. And so just by getting more blood up to the brain helps the brain work better. Antioxidant properties, it's known to accelerate wound healing. Um, and it also can be used with pulmonary inflammation, with asthma, and it passes the blood brain barrier. And this is important because with if it's going to stimulate the production of nerve growth, it's got to get in there somewhere to some way to do that. In addition to um, stimulating nerve growth, it also can increase the myelination, the sheath. That, that like the insulation that surrounds nerves, it sometimes when that insulation gets worn away or, or um, destroyed for one reason or another, um, you get short circuits and the nose don't, the nerves don't work. And by, by restoring the myelination, by restoring the, um, you know, the, um, the sheath that the nerve grows in, it improves the function of the nerve. Turkey tail. Tramides versicolor, found everywhere. It's a polypore as well, just like um, Rishi. And um, it has uh, its primary use um, historically and contemporarily is supporting patients who have cancer, but it also can support a healthy liver. Um, it has anti-inflammatory properties, which could help to um, support healthy joint function. It certainly improves immune function if you have immune weakness. It's known to be helpful with fevers, and viral and bacterial infections. Um, and because of its support of the liver, the inflammatory condition, chronic active hepatitis um, has been found to be um, 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 helped by this, as well as rheumatism, which is the old fashioned term for arthritis. And these are mostly from um, the traditional literature, and I'm not, and I'm not making suggestions that you that these are that the, you should use these medicinally for your animals. The FDA doesn't like us to do that, so we just want to give you the information. Let you make your decisions based on good information. Shiitake, tasty, tasty mushroom. I I have shiitake in lion's mane every week in my meals. And it's called shiitake because it was found natively growing in Japan on the shia tree. The shia is the Japanese evergreen oak, but it also can be found growing on other um, trees, other dead woods as well. Second to the button mushroom and you know the portobellos, um, these are the second most um, commercially manufactured mushroom um, in the world. And these are guild mushrooms. Um, as compared to the uh, pork mushrooms that we were looking at before. And um, it's been around a long time. There's a number of uses for it. It has, as many mushrooms do, this strengthening and restorative function when used as a food. It can increase your stamina and circulation. It can support healthy joint function. It can help maintain normal blood sugar. Um, and interestingly enough, there's a molecule in shiitake and other mushrooms called mavinolol. Uh, mavinolin, which um, there is now a drug that basically is that extracted called lovastatin. Um, it's a statin drug for cholesterol. So mushrooms can, you know, can also lower cholesterol um, because they have this, um, this statin in it, as well as the effect that the beta-glucans have on lowering um, cholesterol. Um, certainly for immune modulation and support of the cancer patient, uh, shiitake is a good bet to try. Now, chaga. Chaga is the 
non-mushroom. I call it the non-mushroom because it's not a mushroom. But actually what the chaga is, is mycelium uh, from the Inanotus obliquus fungus that's growing into the birch tree. And the birch tree is reacting by creating this conch, this canker or this conch. And going back to our doctor's signatures, just as we were discussing with um, lion's mane, this is a tree canker or a tree cancer. And early peoples seeing this applied it to their own unnatural growth, their own cancerous growths, and found that it actually had some benefit. So it it's grows mainly in the northern latitudes, um, Siberia, Finland, the northern, northern latitudes of Canada, on birch trees mostly. Um, and what's interesting is that the birch tree contains some very good medicinal compounds as well called betulins, betulinic acid. And the mycelium absorbs that and concentrates it in the chaga. So chaga, because it's not the mushroom, not the fruiting body, it does not have high levels of beta-glucans, like the reishi, like the shiitake, like the turkey bear, like the lion's mane, you know, and cordyceps. But it does have high levels of, bet of betulinic acid, which is really probably its most potent ingredient. So um, these can grow to be quite large. They're very woody. They're mildly bitter because of triterpenes that are in them. And um, let's go to the next one. There's a number of traditional indigenous uses as a blood purifier, as a tonic, as a pain reliever for ulcers, for gastritis, you know, and it's, has, it's being used as a coffee substitute. Some people drink it regularly and it's a good thing to do because it has such health benefits and they're also making beer out of it, You're using it as a hops substitute. If you've ever read Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the Russian um, um author who um, has won so many prizes, he wrote a book about his own struggles with cancer using chaga in his book, Cancer War. And I suggest you read it. It's a very, it's a very good read. And it's used to support many, many different types of cancers. But in, in Siberia, the, the indigenous folk there used it for tuberculosis, for hepatitis, for parasites, um, heart diseases as an internal cleansing agent. It has a wide variety of applications. Um, active constituents include the beta glucans, but also these terpenoids, these betulinic acid, the nutidiol, and it also contains, like so many other um, um, fungal species, ergosterol, vitamin D2. From published research, we know it's an antioxidant. We know it has anti-neoplastic properties, primarily due to the triterpenoids, the beta-glucans, and the protein-bound polysaccharides in it. The types of cancers they talk about treating with it, breast, lung, cervical, and stomach. No studies in animals with this. We have no idea, and I can't suggest you use it for cancer, but it certainly would be one, one fungal extract that I would consider if my own pet had that problem. Um, it has antiviral activity as well. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty cool fungal, fungal um, extract. So let me give you a little summary here because um, I can get quite confusing. I think all these different properties, all these different mushrooms, you know, you start sweating. Well, which one should I choose? You know, well, that's one reason why Real Mushrooms has created the Five Defenders, which has five of the top mushrooms in it. Um, it has reishi, it has turkey tail, it has shiitake, um, it has chaga. I didn't mention maitake. It has that in it as well. Cordyceps is a whole different mushroom. That's the caterpillar mushroom. Um, so, you know, you may want to just use a shotgun approach, like with something like the five defenders, or you may want to hone down and use a high, a, a large amount of a specific mushroom for a specific purpose. With reishi, think longevity. Remember, it has this antihistamine-like activity. And remember, it can be supportive of stress and can help with calming. I like to take uh, my reishi at night. It helps me sleep better. Turkey tail, think of immune support. Think of a healthy response to viral infections. Think about supporting the patient who has the diagnosis of cancer. Shiitake mushroom, again, immune support, digestive health. And it is restorative and it is strengthening. Um, with lion's mane, the brain, lion's mane, brain, brain, the, the, the mane and brain falls mainly on the plane, I guess. Um, anyway, cognition and calming support, neurologic support and digestive health. Chaga, immune support, 
uh, support for the cancer patient, digestive health support. Cordyceps, we didn't talk about it, but we will. It's a really exciting mushroom. And, and many of you may have dogs that are competing in uh, agility or things like that. Cordyceps is something to think about for that. Um, because it improves stamina and performance. It actually helps the body generate more energy, but not in a, not in a, a fractious way. Um, it can support the lung and kidneys, and it also provides immune support, as so many mushrooms that have beta-glucans do. Well, we're up to the last slide, and I want to thank you so much for for bearing with my 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 quirky nature and my, my quirky presentation. I hope it was beneficial to you. If you have questions, please reach out. We have an email address, pets at realmushrooms.com. And we now we will be launching these products on the 15th of March. You may be viewing this after that, so they should be available on the Real Mushrooms um, website. We have these two um, different types of soft chews. We've got the immune chews, which basically contain the five defenders. Plus, I put a number of other mushrooms in there, uh, another number of other nutrients in there, like the the adaptogen called ashwagandha, and um, and a number of others like that. With the relaxed mushroom chew. We're using the lion's mane combined with the reishi and tryptophan. And believe me, this is a calming, not sedating, but a calming soft chews. They're very tasty, although, you know, some dogs are a little pickier than others. They can be crumbled up and blended in with the food and taken that way as well. We're also coming out with the, all of the single mushrooms in in pet sized capsules. And we're also going to be coming out with them a little later because we're trying, we're, we're getting, I'm putting together special powder formulas that will be uber palatable, uber functional, and so easy. You could just mix them in with some of the wet food you're giving your pet and they'll take it readily. So it's not an issue for you to administer. Anyway, thank you so much for your patience, for listening to me today. Um, let me know what you think about this stuff. Um, please um, send me an email. I'm interested in hearing your thoughts. Take care. He will.